Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. I got a really special guest today that worked at Big Sandy while I was there. I'm going to introduce this guy and let him let him tell you his name and, and tell, a little, tell you a little bit about himself. And, and we're going to talk about Big Sandy and how real it is there. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button. Definitely leave a comment. This is a special video. Please share it. I'm sure there's going to be a message here that people need to hear. Introduce yourself and you know tell the people who you are, where you worked at. And... Uh, my name's David. I worked at uh, USP Big Sandy 07, 08, then again in 15, 16, and 17. And uh, you know I've been in and out of there a few times. So let's just talk about Big Sandy because you worked there while I was there, and it, it was a tough prison, man. And you know we see a lot of these YouTube channels, a lot of people talking about prison. You know a lot of them talk about state prisons, but working at a prison. How did you feel working at Big Sandy? Did you think it was a dangerous place? Big Sandy was absolutely dangerous, especially back then, especially especially when you had inside corridor movements and, you know, everybody was getting mixed up during the movements. Absolutely, it was dangerous. The inside corridor. Let me ask you a question. Let me see if you remember this incident. This happened in 2008 towards the end. The um, ABTs in the Aryan Brotherhood had stabbed my celly. His name was Aaron Pike. They stabbed him about 35 times in the hallway. I don't know if you remember that. He ended up getting up. Both of his lungs were punctured. Um, they stabbed him through both of the hands, stabbed him through the face. Do you remember that incident? It was in the corridor. I don't remember that incident, but, I mean, the stabbings back then at Big Sandy were so common. It was a, I mean, it was a daily thing there for a long time. So you talked about the corridors, and that's, that's where we're going to take our conversation to. See, people don't know about the corridors. There's locked gates all throughout the corridor. So if there's a group of guys that want to stab someone, they're hit, right? They're locked in this little area, and they got nowhere to go. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you're in there, and you know, I won't you know, get too much into the, the operating and security of it, but especially back then, because they would call, when they call movements, they would let units intermingle. They don't do that anymore. But, you know, like, B and C side would, you know, meet in the hallway a lot of times. And, uh, you know, if there was dudes from one unit that wanted to get to a dude in another unit, that was prime time. And there were so many people in that corridor when it jumped off, it took forever to get to it or to even see what was going on. Let me ask you this. You were, did you work housing units? Where did you work when you were working there? Housing units. Housing units. You ever seen anybody get stabbed in your housing unit specifically? Sure. Sure, they, uh, generally speaking, I, I'll tell you a, a good story. I was talking to an Hispanic inmate one day. Me and him got along pretty well. And he said, if you ever see me coming to stab somebody, he said, don't get in my way. I said, buddy, I've got keys and a radio. I said, I'm not getting in your way, but I said, let me ask you why. He said, because if I don't get to that guy and stab him, I'm going to get stabbed. So he said, I will have to stab you to get to him. Man, rough life. You know, and this isn't a knock on correctional officers or guards, you know, prison guards, but, you know, you know, a lot of times you hear guys like, yo, man, I'm gonna, I'm, I'll knock this dude's lights out. I'll stab this dude. Do you think there was guards there that were scared, man? Absolutely. Uh, you could tell. Most of the people that work there, you know, are pretty solid people. But absolutely, you have people that come in, and generally the ones that was, you know, if they thump their chest and they, they talk tough and they, they disrespect the people and cuss at people, a lot of people don't realize this. There's been hits put on many of people that's worked there that had to be pulled out of that prison. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I tell people all the time, man, you could be the toughest guy in the world, man, but when you walk into Big Sandy, you're walking into a jungle, man. You're walking into a dangerous place, you know, and I wrote a book specifically about Big Sandy. I don't know if you've ever seen the book, but I'm definitely going to send you a free copy if you want one. Um, but I had wrote that book, you know, because it was my first federal prison. And it was an experience like I could never imagine what I was walking into. Like when I first got there, the captain and the SIS lieutenant actually told me to get a knife. They told me, make sure you get a knife. This is a dangerous place. Told me, don't get any tattoos on. They said, no, you're all right. They said, don't get any tattoos on your face and get a knife. And I was just like, wow, these people just told me to get a knife. This is serious, man. This is serious. A lot of people don't realize when you get off the bus and you go through classification, you sit and chew for a little bit and then you go through classification. If you say, if they say, are you affiliated? And you say, no, they're going to say, well, you are now. 
Explain that so that people know. You're affiliated with what? A gang, a group, a car? A gang, car, like Kentucky car, Midwest car, South car. Let's say if you come in there, you know, fresh and you're not, you know, say you randomly robbed a bank. You just happen to use a firearm. So that's automatic pin. And you come through there and you're coming in and, you know, they're doing your paperwork and all this. And they say, who do you run with? And they check your tattoos and all that. And you say, well, I don't run with nobody. They have no gang ink or nothing. And they say, well, you're going, you have to run with somebody. They're like, you're with the Kentucky car. You're with the Midwest car. You know, if you're white, you're running with the whites. Especially if there's a true federal AB on the yard, you're absolutely red and white. So let me ask you this. Were you there when the Nortanios went at it with the Aryan Brotherhood on the yard? Do you remember yeah. that? And there was a there was a white guy that didn't get involved and didn't help, you know, the I mean it don't matter now because I think the dude's dead, but the, you know, the shot caller at that time was Bam, the white A B dude. And there was a white dude that didn't help and was on the yard and ended up kicking his head in. They they beat him up pretty bad. Um and there's an incident I want to, I think you'll probably remember this, because I think I write about this in the book. I don't think I took it out. There was ABTs there and TABs at the time, Aryan Brotherhood of Texas and Texas Aryan Brotherhood. And there was a dude that they had beat on the yard and left him there. They beat him so bad because he was a TAB, not an ABT. And they left him on the yard, and then they ended up getting all the cameras on the yard. Remember when they got the cameras that just stand on poles? It was because they were calling go back and they thought everyone was out of the yard, but that dude was out there laying in the grass. Do you remember that? I don't remember that right offhand, but that don't surprise me in the least. Have you have you ever had to respond to, you know, instance where dudes were stabbed? Oh yeah, all the time. They uh you know, it, it ain't nothing. Well and a lot of times people don't realize it. If it's inside the race, say white stabbing white. And it's not bad or black stabbing black they're not going to lock that prison down just for a few minutes it only really gets locked down when racist cross yeah so let me ask you this if a white guy kills another white guy right they got a beef he kills them how long do you think they would be locked down for that murder because i've been there when people been murdered uh they're going to you know sis is going to do their thing and they're going to go talk to all the shot callers and pull them and uh, if, that, if that ended the beef, if there's no retaliation expected, not long. That prison ain't going to be locked down very long, at least now. I mean, I forget how long it was back then. But on a true murder, a week or two until the investigation's over. Man, I've been in, I was in USP Lee where there was a murder, man. We were locked down for, I think, 36 hours, man. The FBI came in. They did what they had to do in and out, and we were back out. That's all they wait on. If, if As long as it's in a race, they wait for the FBI to come in and do their thing. And once that's done. Isn't isn't that mind boggling that someone can get killed and they open the prison like right away like it doesn't even matter? Oh, yeah. They, uh, you know, whether you get killed, you know, nobody dies in prison. You know, that people need to be aware of that. Nobody dies in prison. They, uh, they will do CPR until you get in that ambulance. They, and why do they why do they do it that way? They they don't want a death at their prison. They want it to be like, oh, you know, we kept him alive until he got on that bus and he got to the ambulance and died at the yeah. hospital. A lot of people don't know when you go to jail or prison, they're responsible for your safety, a hundred percent. You know, because they have custody of you. So if somebody dies on that prison yard or in that prison or anywhere on that property, the BOP is responsible. You know, you could absolutely sue them into the dirt. Yeah. So you ended up you ended up leaving there and got a different job or whatever. Did you feel like it was a relief to leave that prison, man? It, it ain't, you know, it, it's it's I don't know how to put it. It's most days I worked there I had, you know, zero issue. I mean, you you see like, you know, I got along so good in some units. They would wait to do if they were going to hit somebody, they wouldn't do it on my shift so they I didn't have to pack the property. They, uh, I got along good with most people, but I knew going in how to talk with people. You know, if, if I'm working a unit and say, you know, inmates are supposed to get something, they, they're supposed to get it, I'm going to give it to them. If they've got it coming, I'm going to give it. You know, and if you do that, you don't disrespect anybody, but you make them respect you and you respect them, you generally won't have much of a problem as far as working there. But now if you just start popping off at the mouth, disrespecting random people, you're going to get a problem real quick. You know, I always used to say that in prison, man. I would tell the cops that. I would say, hey, man, 
If they ever got out of line with me, I would say stuff like, man, men respect men. Respect me because I'm going to respect you. And that's the only thing I could count on every day is that, you know, with the guards or counselors or case managers, just be the same every day. If you're going to be an asshole, be an asshole. If you're going to be, you know, a nice guy today and then an asshole tomorrow, well, then we're going to have a problem, man. If I got something coming, like you said, and then I got it coming. And it goes, the, you know, the same way with you. I'm not going to come ask you for something that I don't have coming or try to play games. And I think that was the best way to operate. You know, I'd like, you know, when I was there, I thought that, you know, Rios was the was the warden, right? And from my perspective, I think he was a hell of a warden, man, even though there was a lot of trouble there and stuff like that, because he came across as a man that respected men. He would come to the hole and, and you'd say, hey, man, I want to get out. He'd have that Dallas Cowboy coin. Do you remember that? And he would flip it, call heads or tails. And if you called heads, he'd let you out of the hole. If it was tails, he'd tell you, see me next week. Did you know he used to do that type of stuff? I didn't know that. You ever see him stand in the line to get chow with a CO uniform on? I've seen him do that, stand in the line to oh, get yeah. I've seen him back through all over that prison. Yeah. Hey, that guy, I mean, what was your perspective on him? Can you talk about that? What did you think about him as a warden? We interact with him much. Just, you know, you know, him as the warden is me as a new CO. You know, he would talk with you as you came by. He was a real pleasant guy. But now he seemed to really take interest in his job, you know, do his job and enjoy his job. And I know you said you went back to Big Sandy in 15 and 16, right? Were you there? There was a kid that was murdered there. He was a mixed kid. He was black and white. I want to say in 15 or 16. I was actually in Raybrook FCI, made it to an FCI. This kid was my, they stuck us in a six-man cell when we all got there on the bus. So I was in the cell with him. The kid was a real troublemaker. He ended up going to Big Sandy, and one of his homeboys was a crip. They were arguing, and he ended up getting involved, you know, like, not even really getting involved, but it was his homeboy. He was there holding him down, and he got killed, and his homeboy didn't. Were you there when that murder happened in 15 and 16? Not that I remember, but it may if it's the first of 15, I wouldn't have been there. Were you there? Did you ever see anybody get murdered at Big Sandy? Personally, not seeing it, no, but you know, I've been there when, you know, when it's happened. Have you ever responded to a stabbing that ended up, you know, someone died? Sure. Yeah. And what's it like, man, for a guard? You know, because I'm going to tell you my perspective first, right? I think a lot of the guards and all the prisons that I've been in, most of them are hunters, you know, outdoorsmen, been in, either been in the service, and they, you know, they kill animals, they, they see blood, they've, you know, gutted deer. So when they see a, a man get killed, I used to think it didn't affect them, man. Like, they see this shit all the time out here. They're, you know, they got farms, they got horses. Did it affect you to see someone get stabbed, blood air all over the place? I mean, how did it affect you? So where I walked, uh, I walked basically walked straight out of the Marine Corps into that job. I, I had a job offer, of course, as long as I passed everything and all that before I left active duty. And, uh, but I absolutely, you know, when you see somebody land in the pool of blood, whether it was from a stabbing or getting their head stomped in or a lock in a sock, which people don't realize how just what that'll do. And, you know, absolutely it affects you, you know, because you just, you know, pools of blood, pools of blood. A lot of times they'll use the bathroom on their self. You know, it's just a it's just a nasty, nasty sight. It's a bad sight. Hey man, I've seen people killed in prison, man, and it's just like when you see something like that happen, you're just like, wow. You know, especially when you know someone and, and you're like, you talk to this guy today and tomorrow he's dead. I've actually seen people get murdered in my unit, man, at USP Lee. And right after you left, the guy got stabbed by a celly in the head. Um, from D.C., the dude left a knife in his head. They rolled him out. And that guy had already, you know, been stabbing people in USP Lee. So it's just, man, you know, this is the thing that, this, that the community, that society don't see. They don't, you know, they think, you know, prison, prison movies. And th this shit's real, man. People are dying in these places. That's what I, you know, that's been one of the big reasons I wanted to do this interview is to, you know, keep people, people watch prison shows on TV and stuff and, and people talking, they think it gives them like cred and you know on street cred and respect and all this. And they don't realize, you know, if you go to the county jail, not all, there's some plenty of rough county jails. But you know, when you step up to like US penitentiary, some of the real bad state prisons, it just it is no joke. You know, one wrong word, one wrong step, just staring at somebody too long can get you into a world of trouble. Have you seen people get stabbed over nonsense, something small, just a bad look? Or... Absolutely. I've seen it over a washing machine. <laughs> over a washing machine. How about when you worked there, it was pretty racially segregated, right? 
Do you remember that? The only time that I would see races cross as far as running with who's running with who, if you've seen a white crip, a few white crips came in. You, I've never seen a white blood. I don't even know if there's any white bloods, but there were some white crips. And, you know, they would, you know, when they get in the unit, people don't realize the inmates know who's coming to that prison on that bus and who's getting in what unit before we know. They know. I've had them come up to me saying, this person's going to be here off the bus today. They can't be in this unit. I'm like, how in the hell do y'all know that? But they know. I know how they know. You know how they know. But they, uh, they, get, that, they get that bus list from laundry. <laughs> and that, you know, the Muslims will run, you know, white, black, Hispanic, depending on as long as you're a legit Muslim. So you were at Big Sandy when, who I feel is the most dangerous gang in prison, they moved the Nortenos out and they started bringing the Serenos in, the Mexican Mafia. Do you remember when they started bringing busloads of them dudes in? Absolutely. Absolutely. You the were... Hispanic inmates were probably the easiest to deal with because they didn't want you in their business. But now they were very militant. They, they had each other's back to a, you know, they just... It wasn't a gang you wanted to cross, especially if there was a black hand on the yard. If there's a black hand on the yard, even the tangos fell under him. And if he gave a word, it was going to happen regardless. I say, personally, from a prisoner perspective, I believe that the South Siders and the Mexican Mafia are the most toughest, roughest, brutal, and respectful at the same time gang in federal prison. You know, I agree with that. And, and I think... And I don't, and I think the Texas Syndicate dudes were pretty tough dudes too, man. But you agree with that? The Mexican Mafia and the Serranos? Yeah, absolutely. The Hispanics were by far the most brutal, you know, if they had to be, if they had to be. But now a lot of people didn't realize this, but units that were predominantly Hispanic were the easiest units to work because they didn't want you up in their business. So let me ask you this. You're working in Big Sandy, right? And I used to say, man, if I ever worked in a prison, although I never would because I'm a felon, if I worked in a prison, if people weren't raping, robbing, and killing, man, I, I'm, I, it's whatever's going on is going on. You know, these guys got life sentences, man. Did it bother you when guys were getting drunk or did you get involved or they're smoking weed or would you just kind of brush it off, man? Here's how, here's how I've done it. Uh, you know, say, you know, like the, the Mexicans, they would fish cigarette butts out of the hand guards, especially when they went to compound movements. Uh, you know, that's their hustle. I'd be like, you know, don't blow smoke in my face. If you hear keys rattling, just put it out. You know, you know, light it up when I walk by. I've seen it drying out over toilets, you know, like or if they get spit bottles and dry them out. Uh, if somebody's making hooch, it was, I'd be like, you know, I'd trade them for a shank. If I've seen it, like I've walked by cell doors and they'll be in there, got it set up, laundry bags. I'd be like, give me a shank, you know, give me a shank, let me get a knife off the unit, and I ain't, you know, we'll make that trade. And most of them will make that trade, you know, 10, 15 minutes, they'd be like, check behind the dryer, there'd be a shank sitting back there. There's no shortage of shanks in Big Sandy. <laughs> you ever pat a guy down and, and pat him down and there's a knife on him? Yeah, I got poked by one. I had to go get blood work done doing that. Oh, yeah? He had it in his pocket, and it was, I mean, it's about a six-inch knife. A lot of people don't know, you know, like they, they have sheets to them. They'll sew up sheets and stuff. Hey, <laughs> how about when people hide knives? You ever see some crazy hiding places? The craziest thing I saw is the Hispanic work crews would come around and uh, they would go in and they would plaster around the bases of the cells. They would plaster shanks along the wall, run string or dental floss four or five feet down have just a little piece sticking out, you would never know it's there. And when something popped off, they'd just grab that string and rip it out of the wall. <laughs> a lot of people don't know, you know, a lot of people didn't know about that. And something back then, and they know about it now, so I'll, I'll talk about it is, you know, and I think I talked about it in my book, you know, we used to have fake shelves back there and nobody knew about them fake shelves. And finally someone ended up telling on the fake shelves and everybody knew, what did you, have you seen them fake shelves in the locker? I've seen false backs to wall lockers that you could not tell was a false back. They were done perfectly. You ever do a shakedown in a cell and, and look at the top bunk and see all the metals gone off the bed? Absolutely. You can see perfect knives cut out. And a lot of people don't realize this. Uh, you know, 
which I've talked to a couple of them, they either do it with fingernail clippers, and that's thick metal, you know, that bunk metal is pretty thick, thick stuff. But they said you could take dental floss and some of that hair wax and dry it out and saw through that metal. I don't know if you can or not, but that's just what I heard. Well, I, you know, there's a lot of ways of getting them knives out of there, you know, the nail clippers. The, I think that's why they stopped letting us have hair clippers because of the metal guard on there and, you know, stainless steel on stainless steel, you can cut it. You ever wonder why they took the metal monopoly pieces away? I, no, I never, I never thought about it. Is that the why? Dog, the dog fit the security screws. The dog did? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I never knew that, man. Never, never, never knew that at all. What's one of the craziest things you've seen at Big Sandy, man? I probably the which I didn't see it. I was there that night when uh, the knife got slid under the shoe cell door. And they told that dude to come on out if he had the balls to do it. And it just so happened he had the balls to do it. He grabbed that knife and they were dumb enough to crack the door. And he come out and started stabbing everybody. So, they, so the, one of the guards slid him a knife under the door and said, you want to be a tough guy? Come on out. We're going we're gonna to crack this gate for you. And they cracked the gate. He comes out. This is in 2008. He comes out and he starts stabbing the cops. Absolutely. The... the the guy that gave him the knife, the guard, went to prison for that, you know. But, yeah, he carried it in his boot prior to them putting a metal detector in, and which was stupid. Just not like he can do anything with a little pocket knife anyway when you're talking about 20 or 30 people jumping on you. Yeah. Uh, he was in there working shoe, running his mouth. So this is a, he's a black guy. He's a D.C. black guy, big old, big old dude. And he said, that guy said, you know, he said, well, I'll give you this knife and you won't come out and do nothing. The guy said, give it to me. They gave it to him and they rolled the door and he called the bluff. That he did. That was in the paper and everything when that happened. I remember he reading about four or five of them because they all split up and ran different directions. Now he stabbed, I know he stabbed three. He stabbed three. One of them pretty bad. I know there's one thing, man, being a guard, right? I'm sure you guys, and I know this, you guys that are, you know, on the right side of the law, I guess, hate staff corruption, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just because it's not that I don't hate anybody for making a dollar, not in the least. You know, you got to live. Just if it, you know, endangers me personally, you know, absolutely. But, so, you know, when you see a, a new iPhone 11 in a federal prison, it don't get in there in somebody's butthole. That's just not how it comes in. It comes in one way. So let me ask you about that. Do you really think someone having an iPhone in federal prison puts you in danger? No, just depends on what to use it for. There's people in that federal prison up there that's got the power to land a helicopter on that yard if they want to. So no, personally, no, I don't think it put me in any danger. I think most people that have iPhones and stuff in prison, man, they might, you know, they're looking at porno videos, they're calling family, they're, you know, scouring social media, trying to get a girlfriend. And I mean, of course, there's allegations and things happen. You know, there's, like you said, there's dangerous people in there. They can make hits on an iPhone, whatever. But really, man, for the most part, man, dudes are using a phone, man, to meet chicks. Do you agree I, with that? You know, if it, it wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with it if they gave everybody like a like an iPad type thing with a, that you could have 24 seven and, you know, and use social media to a degree, especially to talk to your family when you want to, you know, you're locked in that cell and you can't make phone calls. You know, you need to be able to talk to your family, at least, at least your loved ones or something, something just to pass the time. I think, you know, idle time, idle hands is, you know, the saying, but yeah, I think they should have more stuff to pass the time in that regard. Do you think that the Bureau of Prisons, man, mistreats people? Do you think they, I mean, you work in a penitentiary. Did you ever work in an FCI or a low or anything like that? No, just the, uh, I mean, Big Sandy's got a camp next to it, but. But so you never, you know, in Big Sandy, I mean, there's some people that try to mistreat people, right? And But man, when you get to the lower levels, man, because they know they can threaten you with sending you to a penitentiary, you know, dudes are scared to go there. Me, I personally, you know, the violence was messed up and everything but you know what man sometimes i'm like man i just wish i was in that cell when i got to a low i went to lexington right there in kentucky before i got out that was the worst prison i ever been in and it, and it had the potential to be the most dangerous my dad well that's where he served his time and your dad your dad was a prisoner federal prisoner 
is a federal prison. Ain't that something? Your dad was a federal prisoner, and you, you became a federal uh, prison guard. Ain't that something? He pushed me to take the job because he said it was a good job with good benefits. <laughs> and it worked out, right? It's a halfway house a few months before I got off active duty. Let me ask you this. You ever see guards mistreat people? Not that I've ever seen, but I wouldn't have seen it. If it happened around me, I'd have called it out. You know, we'd have took care of it. Do I think the BOP as a whole mistreats people? No. Do I think certain individuals try to, you know, use their power for, you know, to really mess with people? Absolutely. So you worked B unit. You worked the B side back then, right? When I was there. I was on the A side. You worked the B side. Do you remember a white guy named Martin? He was absolutely nuts, would scream, yell. He'd run the yard. He'd wipe shit all over himself when he was in the shoe. Do you remember Martin? Well, I mean, that was that was a pretty common thing in the shoe, but no, I never, I don't remember him right offhand. How about the black guy they called Soldier Boy? He'd run up and down the yard doing 90, screaming, no shirt on. You don't remember them? The two They were the two craziest dudes I ever seen in federal prison, and I ended up in USP Lee with both of them dudes, and I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I thought I shook him when I left Big Sandy. Now, that, you know, a lot of people don't realize, you know, just, you know, I, I guess it, if you're down for a long time in a place like that, it would be easy to lose your mind. You know, it, it'd be a very easy thing, you know, to mentally break. I, I won't say his name, but there was an inmate up there that probably could have got out. and He'd been in, he got home from Vietnam, robbed a bank, and you know, somebody ended up getting killed. He got life, and he had been in prison ever since. Now, he could have went home a couple times, but now he just wouldn't go. And if they was going to send him, he would do something to make sure he caught some more time. Ain't that something? Been in there so long. It's like that Shawshank Redemption movie, man. Been in there so long, you don't even want to go home. Yeah, it's, he was just, he was truly institutionalized. Yeah, he was just, he said at his age, because he was in his 70s, he said, what am I going to do out here? He said, I don't, have, I don't know how to use any technology. I have no job skills. And he was a really smart guy. And uh, he just said, there's nothing for me out there anymore. So let me ask you, working as a guard, a prison guard, was there anything in there that ever bothered you, man? Anything ever hurt your feelings, man? No, I, I think if you get, you know, if, if, if stuff hurts your feelings, you know, a penitentiary is definitely ain't the place to work. They, uh, when you first start in a prison, you know, especially one like that, you're going to get tried. They're going to see, you know, people are going to see what they can get away with. And if, if you break one time and, you know, and you let somebody, you know, push over you, walk over you, you're ruined. You might as well quit. Uh, so, no, you got to, you know, you're going to get called names. You're going to get, you know, arguments. That's just life in it. You know, you just got to let that roll off and, you know, people have bad days. Was there ever... A time, and I'm going to get back to that in a minute, right? Let's go back there. What I meant by it, has there ever been anything that ever hurts your feelings? What I mean by that is, you ever see a dude get killed that you thought was an all right dude, and now you're like, damn, man, they killed that dude. And you went home and maybe it played in your mind like, damn, the dude seemed like an all right guy, man. There was a black dude in there from Kentucky. I guess I won't say his name. Actually, I don't even think I remember his name. This dude, he told me what he had done, why he was in there. A lot of people don't realize if it's a federal charge and a firearm's involved, automatic pinpoints, it don't matter. He, and I, I read his paperwork, he brought me his paperwork. He crossed state lines and sold his uncle, who he didn't know was a felon, a handgun. It was a legally owned handgun. He didn't know the uncle was a felon, and he didn't know he wasn't allowed to cross state lines to do that. You have to go through an FFL to cross state lines. They, uh, from Kentucky law and federal law, and he sold that gun. His uncle got caught with it. They ran it, came back to him. And that's why he was in USP Big Sandy. And, yeah, I felt very bad for that dude because he did not, you know, he did not deserve to be in any prison, let alone one like that. Would you say it was one of the most dangerous prisons back in 07, 08, 09 in the country? I, I would say, you know, the Internet wasn't what it was back then, so you couldn't really see a lot of what was happening with other prisons. But as far as federal penitentiaries go, yeah, absolutely. And I don't see how any other state prison could have been any more dangerous than Big Sandy back then. I tell people that all the time. I say when I was in Big Sandy, it was the most dangerous prison in the federal prison system and probably one of the most, if not the most dangerous, in the country. I mean, we have a lot of dangerous prisons in California and state prisons.
So let me ask you this, you know, Big Sam, do you think that was probably one of the most dangerous prisons in the country at the time, right? Absolutely. What makes you think it was one of the most dangerous prisons in the country? A lot of people don't realize, you know, especially when you step down from the ADX, you're going to one of the penitentiaries. So you have uh, even people from Guantanamo Bay, you have ISIS, you have Al Qaeda. The guy that built the first World Trade Center bomb has been in that prison. I've talked to him. You have, uh, you have, you know, black hands, which it's hard to explain what a black hand is, but they're extremely dangerous people. You know, the last one that was up there before I left had over a hundred grand on his books. I personally looked at it. Uh, there was Colombian drug lords in there that could snap their fingers and had you or your family killed. There's, you know, that it was just a full of dangerous people. Now that Colombian drug lord, let me say, was probably the nicest guy and the absolute only person I know that could walk that yard by themselves. They didn't have to run clicked up. Ain't that something? So this is what I want to do, right? We're gonna we'll close out the video, but you know. I think we should definitely do a part two, man, and get more into Big Sandy, man. You, you want to come back on for a part two? Yeah, we can do a part two. All right. So, you know, I hope everybody liked the video, man. You know, this guy is not a guy that was ever arrested or anything like that. He was a Marine. He worked in, you know, one of the most dangerous prisons in the country. You know, he's retired now. He walked away, but he gives you a different perspective, man. And, you know, the things that he talked about, it's not coming from a former prisoner. It's coming from a former prison guard. And, you know, I want kids to hear this, man, because it's not just coming from me. I want kids to know that on the other side, that you've seen this stuff, that this stuff is real, man, that people can die. People can Absolutely. lose their lives, man. So is there anything you want to say before we close? Uh, just just if, if you're thinking about, you know, committing any kind of bad crime or especially a federal crime that can land you in a federal, you know, prison, especially a federal penitentiary, just do not do it. Uh, you know, a lot of people have no idea what they're going to be walking into. And this just, it's not a place you want to be. It's just not a place you want to be. You heard it from the man right there, ladies and gentlemen. Blood on the razor wire. Hit the subscribe button. It's real. It's raw. Make sure you share the video.